Thank you everyone for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Nick and I'm one of the events hosts here at Portal Palace Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I wanna encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at palace.com. Includes both our live events and our uh, virtual events, just like this one. So if you don't already do so, please follow us on our social media channels via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Rachel M. Harper in conversation with Jacqueline Woodson, talking about Rachel's new novel, The Other Mother. Rachel M. Harper is the author of the novels Brass Angle Blues and this, this, this Side of Providence, which was shortlisted for the Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. Her work has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and has been widely published and anthologized. Um, the Other Mother is a page-turning generational saga about a young man's search for a parent he never knew. Moving seamlessly between the past and present, this novel celebrates the complexities of love and resilience, masterfully exploring the intersections of race, class, and sexuality, the role of biology in defining who belongs to whom, and the complicated truth of what it means to be a family. Harper will be joined in conversation by Jacqueline Woodson, author of more than two dozen award-winning and best-selling books, including the memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming, the National Book Award finalist in other Brooklyn and Red at the Bone. This event will include an audience Q&A, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well as if someone has typed a question you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Lastly, support Rachel and Powell's by purchasing a copy of her book from us. A link to buy The Other Mother will be shared in the chat a couple of times tonight. So Rachel and Jacqueline, we are so thrilled to welcome you and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. It's so cool to be um, metaphorically, virtually at Powell's tonight with you, Rachel. I haven't seen you in forever in real life. It's been years. It's been, been years, out. crazy, even right, right, pre-pandemic, you know. Oh, um, so yeah. it's great. It's great to have this opportunity. And I was just telling Nick, as much as I love Powell's in person, like I, I think it's such a great bookstore in terms of the physical space. Um, but obviously, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to do it virtually and to be here with you. We are like pinging all over the country to be in this moment right now. So it's excellent. Yeah, it's so great. Um, and thank you. I just want to <clears throat> shout you out. I was looking at your book tour and seeing that you're going to all these independent bookstores, which is so fabulous. And um, and you're speaking with some, you know, Mama um, um, Daniel Alexander Jones. I know you did something with Shay Youngblood. There was someone else interesting that you were about. You were going to speak to, and I'm like, uh, oh, Casey, Casey, who I love. Oh man, yes. so so and and just in terms of the other mother being in conversation with all of these other writers. It's such a brilliant book. It's such a beautifully written book. And, um, and I don't, I, I hadn't read your writing in a long time. And I think I had forgotten how lyrically you tell stories and apologies for that. I should have gone back. I should have just kept <laughs> reading you, but when the other mother was coming out, I was just so excited. I love that Powell's is trying to start something at 805. That's some Portland time because I know people are gonna still be coming in. So, um, <laughs> I, and, and I know you're going to read for us, but I was wondering, if maybe we should hold off for the re from the reading for maybe about four minutes, just to let the, a okay. couple more people arrive. And um, how many years has it been since um, between the two books? Okay, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, in terms of publication, mm -hmm. um, it has been six years. Um, and yet, you know, I actually was working on this book before This Side of Providence came out. Um, you know, I was telling someone the other day, this book for me um, has been the, the real, a real journey. And it has been something that I had the idea of it many years ago. And I knew that not only did I have to wait and become a better writer, but I knew I needed to sort of grow emotionally um, to deal with the complexities of all the different storylines and just to feel my way into all the characters equally. I think, um, you know, for me, 
there are some parts of the story that are based on similar um, things that have happened to me, you know, similar experiences I definitely fictionalized deeply, um, but I, 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 so I'm sort of more sensitive and more attuned to some of um, the things that happened to some of the characters and not the others. And, and I wanted to write a, a well-balanced story, um, which is partly why I chose the structure I did in terms of the different books and being with each character for about 50 to 70 pages, depending on the story. Um, I wanted to have that space in terms of the book and, and then the time with them to really understand their side. Because mm -hmm. for me, um, there's not just one straight, you know, hero and villain. Um, it's complicated. You know, there's a lot of uh, secrets and, and mistakes people make. And, and there's a lot of work people have to do as a family for them to reconnect because there's been these divisions um, in the story. You know, Jenry didn't know half of, of the story of his upbringing, didn't know a whole side of his family. Juliet has been, uh, you know, longing for this child that she lost. She feels, you know, like the victim. Um, you know, feels like Marissa took him away from her. Marissa feels like she was justified in doing what she did. You start to understand how the grandfathers were involved in this interesting way. Um, you know, so for, for me, it was like, I needed to understand everyone in a different way. And partly writing the book helped me get there. You know, it helped me um, realize that I had to feel my way into everyone's behavior, mm -hmm. not just the ones that I thought, sort of thought like, oh, you know, I understand that one and this one makes sense. And, you know, this one did some shady shit, but like not that bad. <laughs> but, but then it was like, when I wanted to make them really human, I was like, I have to really understand these motivations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, why would someone do this? Um, what happened to make it okay in their mind? And, and the work of that has taken me all of these years. So to go back to your original question about the time and working on the other book, it was like, I was moving this one forward and then I would take a break. Um, and then I had the whole, you know, then this side of Providence came out and, and that was a really intense year for me because this book came, that book came out in 2016 and then my father passed away um, like a month later. And so it was like, wow. And I just went into some like serious grieving um, and I had to put this book down for a while because um, as people who know me could imagine that that the, the character of Winston um, has a little bit of, of uh, mm -hmm. truth based in my father and, and my relationship with my father um, in, in some ways mirrors uh, Juliet and Winston's relationship. So when my father passed away, I, uh, I really had to, to sort of get the distance from my own life and, my, and Rachel and, and my grieving and, and the character. And it was great because when I took that time, then I went back to it and I could have that objectivity and, and, and have this more of a separation uh, and then be ready to, you know, sort of do the work of the book and not just like Rachel's work. Uh, that's so interesting. You know, um, when I got the other mother and we've known each other, you know, we met in Kentucky, we've known each other for many years. And I was looking at your author photo and I said, Harper, Harper, she looks a lot like Michael. I wonder if. <laughs> and so then I went to Wikipedia and I'm like, oh my goodness, I never made the connection that, you know, your father was the beloved poet, Michael S. Harper. So, um, so that was a surprise moment for me. I, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm, I tend to be a little slower moving than other folks. No, but, I understand, um, you know. Uh, so, so I would love for you before we go deeper into some of um, the characters and, and the way you decided to build this story to read to us from it. Okay. All right. So I thought that I would read um, a section from the first book, which is called The Sun. Um, and it is the book that starts us uh, off. So again, for those of you who might not know, you know, the books within the books, there are seven books. Um, the book is broken, the novel is broken up into seven books. And the first one is when we're with Jenry and that's, he's the college student. He's just gone off to Brown University on a, on a music scholarship. And I want to read um, from chapter six, which is just after he's found out 
about this other side uh, of his family he didn't know. He's just met his grandfather and the, the grandfather has told him that uh, the circumstances of his birth that he was, that his mother was with Winston's daughter, um, not his son. So even though the, the story that he, that he grew up with that, that Jasper was his father was more complicated because no one told him about Juliet. So in this scene, uh, Jenry has just left the grandfather's office. He's, he's stunned and he calls his, his own mother um, and he confronts her for the first time. So it's a phone call, but the only thing you need to know is that Jenry is outside in a park. He's walked off campus um, in Providence he's, and the park overlooks the city. What he remembers most from the phone call is the silence. The moments when she doesn't interrupt, doesn't explain, and doesn't justify. The fact that she doesn't cover her lies with more lies. She listens, lets him talk and ask questions, lets him yell. When she does speak, all she says is that she's sorry. Sorry for the lies, yes, but more for the truth she now has to explain, and for her cowardice, of course, in leaving the first part of the task, that enormous truth-telling, to a relative stranger. He doesn't want her apologies, not now, not ever. But the worst part is that he knows he can never get what he really wants, time. He wants to go back and relive all the moments when he accepted the strange explanations, the half-truths and partial truths and straight up lies about who and what their family was, why he was born in Providence, if they were living with her parents in Miami, why there were hardly any photos of him before the age of three, why he only had one picture of his father, one from before Jenry was even born, why his mother, raised to be a good Catholic girl, had a baby without getting married, and finally, why she never brought any boyfriends around, never introduced him to any, anyone special aside from a few friends at the hospital. This is the part of the story that he's hung up on now. This is where his mind, stretching so hard to wrap itself around a new narrative threatens to break. I don't understand, mommy. I mean, why didn't you just tell me? He skirts around the word until finally blurting out, are you gay? He's not sure he's ready to hear the answer. It's not as simple as that, she says, her voice steady, even. Really, it seems simple to me. You either sleep with women or with men. It feels wrong to talk this way to his mother but the words come out before he can stop them. Well, I've been with both. So what, depending on your mood? It's not, she stops herself. It's not something you can understand. You're damn right I don't understand. How you could lie to me my entire life. How you built up this man, this myth. And in the end, it turns out he wasn't even my father. I mean, he was technically, but I wasn't a son to him. I was just a bastard. You had two parents, she interjects, her voice calm and unwavering. Are you kidding me? You think she counts? I don't even know that she existed until today. He's getting louder now and he feels the anger flush his face. He looks around the park, but no one is in earshot. She was there from the beginning. During my pregnancy in the hospital, she took care of you. She changed more diapers than I did. He waits for his mother to say her name, thinking maybe that will change something, will be a clue to why this happened, but it never comes. This doesn't make any sense. He pinches his eyes closed and lets out the breath he's been holding. His cell phone is hot against his ear. Look, she says, I was heartbroken and alone after we broke up. I didn't know what to do. You went home to your parents. You were never alone. But it's different than being with a partner. I couldn't share everything with them. She coughs. <clears throat> they didn't accept that part of my life. What does that mean? Desperate and confused, he just wants to get to the bottom line. I'm saying, I didn't have some elaborate plan where I sat down and figured out the rest of your life step by step. When I left Providence, I didn't know where I was going. And when I got here, I didn't know I was starting a new life. I had a baby and I needed a place to live and a way to take care of you. My parents gave me that. They gave up a lot to take us in and I had to give up things too. Like the truth, he spits the word out like a swear. She doesn't respond right away. The word truth echoes in Jenry's mind like a heartbeat. Yes, I suppose I did. 
He hears regret in her voice, maybe even shame. And for a second, he starts to feel sorry for her. But then he remembers the boy he was, afraid to tell the smallest white lie, terrified of disappointing her. And the fury is back. That is such a cop out, mommy, to act like you had no choice, like someone made you lie to me. I'm your son, your son. He stops, his voice breaking over the word, unless that is part of the lie as well. He hears her inhale a quick sudden gasp and knows he's crossed the line. I think we need to be done talking, she says. I think we're done. She is trying to help him, to save him from saying something he can't take back but he doesn't want to be saved. Do you know what I think? He walks away from the bench and steps onto a stone ledge, tracing the edge of the park. He grabs one of the pickets, the iron cool in his grip and hard as ice. The pointed end pokes into his chest like an arrow, like it could pierce his skin with one deep breath. I think you did this on purpose, he says, his voice turning hoarse, letting me come up here so someone else could explain your mess. I think you're a coward, mommy. Watch yourself right now, she warns. You don't have all the answers. She sounds cold and unfamiliar, not like the woman who raised him. You're right. Thanks to you, I don't. He laughs bitterly. I wish you would listen. Hear me when I say I didn't plan it like this. She starts talking faster, afraid he'll cut her off. I didn't want to tell you. I wanted to tell you about her myself. So many times I started the conversation, wrote letters I never finished, but you didn't want to hear it. So wait, this is my fault? No, it's not about fault. It's about what happened, how we got here. Just know that it, it wasn't what I wanted. He squeezes the fence post, holds the picket in his hand like a weapon. You must have known this would come out, he says, his voice pleading now. I don't get it. If you didn't want me to know, why did you let me come here? Her father had retired from the university. How could I know he would still be on campus? Jesus Christ, he must be close to 80. She inhales sharply. He imagines she's just lit a cigarette and is now holding the smoke in her lungs, waiting for the nicotine to hit. You let me apply. Let me accept the scholarship. You let me come. It wasn't me who suggested it. Your abuelo talked to the recruiter. He brought you to the audition. You paid for the SAT prep course, mommy. You bought the sweatshirt. She has no response to that. I thought there would be more time, she says. The phone crackles and her words cut out. It's all happening so fast. You had my whole life to tell me. It wasn't just my decision. She exhales. Your grandparents, they, they didn't want you to know. So what? Don't you think knowing them could have helped me? We helped you, we gave you everything. He jumps down from the ledge and turns his back on the city. I was the only black kid in our neighborhood, the only one in my graduating class. Do you think that was easy for me? Always standing out, even at home, I was the only one who was different. You stand out because you're special. Her tone is softer now. You have talent that no one in our family has. He shakes his head. They have it. And then just to hear it out loud, he says, the Pattersons. He lets the name sit in the air between them. I don't know what else to say, she offers weakly. I did the best I could. He hears the familiar tap of her packing her cigarettes. I'm sorry. A part of him believes her, but it doesn't matter. He's not ready for a truce. Are you smoking? He asks, his tone accusatory and filled with judgment. This is an old battle between them, one he's lost hundreds of times, but still, he can't let it go. You've caught me again, haven't you? She says with a hollow laugh. He imagines her face, the youthful smile. A thousand miles away, she says, and I'm still not free to do what I want. This surprises him to hear that freedom is something she's wanted as well, something she doesn't have. He hears the sound of her inhaling the smoke and then soft like a whisper, the sound of her letting it all go. All right, I'll, I'll stop there, that ends the chapter. Oh man, you just wanna sit with the words a while. Um, it's such a beautifully graphic scene. You 
paint in that moment and in so many moments. It was such a beautiful reading. Um, so the book is told from many different points of views. And um, we start with his, um, and I have to say, you know, my partner's name is Juliet. <laughs> I have a 14 year old <laughs> son at home and we just had the biggest fight before this, <laughs> before, you know, and, and it was like, oh, teenage boys, teenage boys. But I, I think one interesting thing about him that I wondered is how did he become so binary <laughs> in terms of, you know, and, and I know it's, it's where we are when we're young, it's either are, yeah. make a choice. Um, but I, I was just like, oh, oh, I feel, I, I, I feel her pain. I, I'm, I, I want to know why you decided to. I have so many questions. Make the, make it um, an interracial family first, and, and to have to negotiate these two cultures. Yeah, um, that was important to me because. First of all, it speaks to my own experience, you know, as a biracial person, um, I'm very familiar with um, all that that means in terms of your own self, struggles with your identity and your parents being from these different worlds. Um, and, you know, I wrote a lot about that in Brass Ankle Blues and I wanted it to feel different. And in terms of my own experiences, my own relationships, you know, I've, I've been in relationships with several people of different backgrounds. Um, and that was a place of interest to me in, mm -hmm. in interracially dating and partnering myself and a place often of tension. Um, and so I felt like, again, in fiction and in, in narratives, you know, just any place you can have tension and conflict. Um, and I also thought for January specifically to have, in addition to this larger identity um, sort of crisis that he has throughout the book in terms of this secret coming out, I, I thought that to add the cultural element as well would be like another place where he's trying to integrate. And I think it's always interesting how a lot of times people's ability to deal with either a biracial person or bicultural or any kind of um, you know mixed identity, it, it often says more about the person than, than you. Mm -hmm. But when you're young, a lot of times, and I relate to this from my own experience, you you don't necessarily uh, understand that. So you sort of do your own level of like code switching based on who's coming at you and what they're coming with. Mm -hmm. And I just thought um, the the language difference and to have this this young man who is obviously like fluid in certain ways with like how it would have been for him to be raised and and to speak Spanish, but then have this black. Um, ancestry and, and identity that he's trying to understand and also being an artist. For me, he's an artist in that family and in his Cuban family, he's the only one. But when he comes and he meets the black side of his family, that's what they all are. And, and so again, it's that like recognizing yourself, feeling out, feeling like an outsider, feeling different. And I just thought it was another layer um, and it feels like it's another part of the American story and it, again it has been so deeply like connected to my own life and relationships that it felt uh, like it felt important and, um, and, it, and it definitely felt like it would ratchet up the, the tension for this young man because I was trying to sort of give him um, even more hurdles but also you know when I look at our country I feel like every hurdle we have, if we can overcome them, it's, it's like more joy and more, more beauty at the end, but it's, it's hard. It's those, those challenges. So, you know, I gave them to the characters as well. And it's so true. You know, Jen Reese's story is such the American story, right? Of, of people not always telling the truth, of belonging to more than one narrative, of trying to negotiate the places where people kind of assume you don't belong um, and, and so many ways in which he, he moves through the world negotiating it. Um, and you've written, you've written a love story, you've written a family story, you've written a story about making family. And I think that that's one of the things that was, that really held me is as, as you know, as someone who's queer, who has an interracial family, who has, you know, 
two kids in the world and and the fear people's fear of saying how did you do it right and like how did you get these kids what does that one look like you what does that one look like your partner or whatever the thing is and um and you break so many questions that people are afraid to ask down um and I want to know was that intentional or was that part of the journey and I loved how you talk about how the book right in writing the book it helped you understand so much about so many things, um, which I think is what writing does, right? It, we write the questions we have. But I wonder about that, that specific part about queer family and, and love and the way we create family. I don't know if that question I mean, is clear. <laughs> yes, no, of course. I, I think that um, because of my life and, and how I've lived it, how I've made family, this is all, all very important to me, but again, I think it does speak to larger issues that anyone can relate to. Um, because I think, you know, when I decided for myself, you know, to have a family and to have children, um, I knew there were a couple routes, but like I, I, until you've been through it, you don't necessarily understand what it's gonna mean like what all the repercussions are. You sort of do the best you can with the world as it is at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, you see what happens. And so a lot of it for me was, wow, you know, I built families and then I, from both my childhood, like, you know, my parents and making families across these like racial lines um, divorce and, you know, my own path, um, making families, having there be breakups, remaking families. These are all things that I've gone through as a parent, as a child. Um, and it was complicated. And, and I definitely felt like, well, if I can make it through this and, and have something to come out on the other side, you know, have some work um, that can mean something that could help someone feel seen, um, or sort of just make meaning of it, it would be, it would be sort of worth the pain and the, and the struggle um, and the loss. And so it was important to me to be both telling versions of my own stories and, and other people, you know, sort of my friends and family, you know, I, 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 I mix like most, you know, fiction writers where we're fictionalizing, but we're often pulling deep truths from um, either our own history or just anyone we're talking to. I mean, you know, it's dangerous to talk to a novelist on the street corner because they might pull, you know, something that you just said in passing. I'm, I mean, everybody knows that. I'm always writing everything down that, that other people say. And, you know, but, but this one, I think, was very close to my heart because of the couple of the, of the dynamics, not just, you know, the queer and the parenting, for sure, but like I said earlier, the relationship between um, Juliet and, and her father, Winston, and the relationship I had with my father, who was also a, a college professor, who was also an imposing figure, who was very loving, but also um, had a real, uh, you know, intense way of being in the world and very high standards. And I was interested in, in writing about artists um, and there are journeys, our struggles with self-doubt and with success um, and people who are tremendously gifted and talented, but can also be self-destructive. Um, all of these themes, you know, were, were really important to me um, to, to sort of examine. And like I said, to, to work through to the best of my ability as a writer and as a human being. You know, so I, I, I tell my kids all the time, you know, my journey as a parent is ongoing. You know, I get when in a book, I get to hit the end and close it and sort of have a resolution, have a takeaway. And in real life, it's like, it's just time to make dinner again, you know, and, <laughs> and, and so like, I'm like, okay, well, we're learning together, you know, and, um, yeah. and, and with kids at different stages, that whole thing, you know, I've just got um, one, you know, at 18, my oldest. And so it's like, okay, like the idea of leaving the house and going off and what that's going to mean. And we're all, you know, sort of transitioning, um, just like the characters in, in the book, you know, so it's an ongoing yeah. journey, but I do feel that, that writing it, you know, it was, it was cathartic. 
um, in a lot of ways. And, and I hope that a lot of that is, is what readers can get too, just, you know, in their own lives or just imagining. It's so true because it's so a book about parenting and the mis when we think we're doing the right thing and, you know, our children becoming adults hits us in the face with the mistakes we make. And I think that's, you know, you write so specifically about something that's so universal. And um, I, I just, I, I was just like, oh my goodness, <laughs> she's writing my life. And I always talk about Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, who talks about the importance of people having both mirrors and windows in their lives, right? Mirrors so they see reflections of themselves in the book mm -hmm. and windows so they see into worlds they would never have otherwise imagined. And I feel like that's what um, the other mother is, is both those um, worlds walking side by side and that I kept seeing reflections of myself as a young mother and being idealistic and you know falling in love for the first time and and having all these dreams of what it meant to raise a child and and then that idea of that child being grown and being like I got questions Jeremy's like I got questions <laughs> and I think every parent knows that journey where they're like wow Maybe I didn't see, you know, I, I didn't have a map. Like none of us have a, has the map for our specific family because we're just now writing that map. Um, but I, I, I won't talk too much about book seven, which just had me in tears. <laughs> it was just so beautifully written. But in terms of thinking about how did you decide even that um, to write it as books? you know, as opposed to sections or as opposed to ch uh, alternate chapters or however, because each book is a different POV. Yeah, I, I think it was interesting. You know, I had played around like in my second um, novel, This Side of Providence, which I also had multiple narrators, but in a very different style because it was like short, it was just chapters. Mm -hmm. um, and I was inspired by Faulkner's As I Lay Dying for that one where it was just like, you you know, the, the narrative goes forward chronologically, but you're jumping between characters and it's very brief. And I thought, well, for a, a chronological story, that makes a lot of sense because you won't get lost when you're moving between characters. Um, and that worked with that story. But with this one, I wanted more time and space to develop and, and to have you really stay with the characters. And as I began to structure it, I thought, well, for example, like I really wanted Jasper, who is, um, you know, Winston's son, Juliet's brother, mm -hmm. um, Jenry's father, um, you know, the, the way that it's set up, and you know this from the beginning of the book, you know, he has, he dies when Jenry's two. So, but I was like, you know, he's a very important character. So the way to have him in there is to go back in time. You know, when I when I was thinking about the present timeline, when we're with like Jenry and Juliet and Winston um, in the present, when they're at when Jenry comes to Brown University and that's all you know fundamentally takes place in Providence, I then wanted to juxtapose like a truth that you learn with them, and then the next section I wanted it to like undo or at least not necessarily undo, but like shed more light. And in all three of those, it was about going back in time. So it's like the end of where I just read and there's just like one more chapter um, in Jenry's section where he then goes and meets Juliet for the first time as far as you know he can remember and, and confronts her. So after confronting his mother, then he confronts Juliet. And then I thought, well, now instead of carrying his story forward, how great to go back in time and to understand why Marissa did what she did. She says what she says on the phone, but in real, it's like, really what happened? And I was like, well, let me just start with the women meeting. You know, let me start in the beginning of their relationship. Um, and then I like sort of move through time in a, in a way I felt like that was the way it's a little, I mean, it's, it's maybe strange um, talking about it. Cause, but for me, it felt natural because it was like, I, I just kept saying, you know, what else do I want to know, you know, and then that led me to the next section. And it was also like, what's the most fundamental 
um, part of the narrative for this particular character when we're with them. So mm -hmm. it's like, I'm going to have this amount of time with them. Do they need to be in the past or the present? You know, I kind of asked myself those questions as I was uh, putting it together. And I wanted it to feel um, not sort of discombobulated. So starting in the present and then moving back to the past, going back to the present, back to the past, like that felt like it had a nice rhythm, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and hopefully is, is unexpected too. Like when you're, you know, when you're reading, um, cause it's kind of like, oh, wow, where am I going to, you know, what's going to be next? Um, and I feel like it's for me in my mind, it's like a circle as opposed to just going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of, I often picture things like that, like sort of you start the book and then it's like, you go around. So you, you come back in a certain way, symbolically to the beginning at the end, um, with the idea of a, another child and Juliet, you know, is she going to have this chance to be a parent again? And what's that going to mean for her? Wow. That's so great. It, it's, it, and there's so many truths, right? You know, you open the book and you think there's so many lies and lies. And it's like, no, there's so many truths. Um, can you talk a little bit about, and I promise, I think there's some questions here, but I want to know about your writing. Are you still teaching? I am teaching. Yeah. Um, so I do. Sorry, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm fortunate because, um, you know, I've been teaching at Spalding University's, mm -hmm. um, brief residency program. It's got a much longer name now because we've got new funding. It's, oh, really? um, but it's a school of writing. Sorry. They're going to be upset with me that I'm getting the name <laughs> wrong. It's a great program. I've been there for like 16 yes, years or something. Yeah, it's a great program. Um, and I've loved it. And I love my students and my colleagues. Um, and it's been a wonderful experience. And they've always been, you know, brief residency. So I was able to, you know, it's in, that's where we met, you know, obviously, mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you know, that um, when we, when the program broke brought you to talk and give an amazing talk. So yeah, we're in Louisville there and then mm -hmm. everybody can live anywhere and can come. Um, for the time of the residency. So I've been doing that for years, all while my kids were really young and it gave me such great flexibility. Um, and then a few times I've taught, like I, I, I was teaching before the pandemic um, at a MFA program in, in LA um, at Otis College of Art and Design. And then, you know, the pandemic, things got um, tough with that and our enrollment and stuff. So I'm not doing that right now, but it's a part of my life that I love, like I love teaching, um, but I'm always trying to find that balance and it's nice. I've never had to have, um, you know, I've never had a full time, like full load teaching gig, which I, I really, you know, mm -hmm. I have a lot of respect for, for my colleagues and folks that, that do that because, um, you know, that would be challenging. And I know that world, like from my father, you know, growing up and, and seeing someone in academia and, um, you know, his breaks and his time at, at uh, colonies like Yaddo and, you know, meant a lot because, you know, the, the commitment to the students and to those relationships, um, you know, it takes, it takes a lot away, but, but I like the balance. I like doing both. I'm, I'm more of an extroverted person. I know a lot of writers are introverts, but um, so when I'm like alone, I'm like, I need to go out. And so that's why I love whenever I'm in Louisville, um, with folks at Spalding and anytime if I go to AWP or, you know, just to be with other writers and artists, um, that helps a lot with the creative juices. That's you funny. know, I love stuff. being alone so much. <laughs> <laughs> I get nuts in my stomach. But um, so, so in terms of that balance, you're a mom, you're a teacher, um, and you're a writer. And then there was a pandemic. But um, so, so how, how, this was probably finished before the pandemic or close to being. Finished. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was. And then I was still, um, I had notes from my agent um, and I had been, you know, just working on the notes from my wife, who was my first uh, editor always um, that I'd been working on for several years. But then I had that last round of notes from my agent mm -hmm. um, and I worked on that during the, the pandemic. You know, at first it was a little tricky. I was teaching and I finished up the semester and my kids doing all the at-home learning. It was, you know, tough time for all of us. And then all of a sudden I just was like, 
I have to really, you know, take the most of this opportunity. Um, and then we actually did, we sold the book in the, during the pandemic. Um, and then that was like year one. And then year two was when I was like working on some more revisions with Dan, my editor um, at Counterpoint. So yeah, I mean, it's funny. It's like, it's been a pandemic book in a sense because I've done so much work, but I had definitely been working on it, um, you know, by myself for years before that. Wow. So how did you do it when the kids were home? How old are your kids now? Um, they are like 18. Um, my stepson is 17 and then my littlest is 11. So, you know, it's a span. We're, we're fortunate. I have a lot of friends and, and family who had kids like five and under. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how they made it, you know, because I, everybody in my house could read, you know, and if you can read, you can read to yourself. It's just like, okay, you got to just give us a break. Like everybody go into your corners. You know, at some points we were all like trying to, you know, share the, the broadband of the, you know, with our internet connections. It was like, wow, are we going to have to like get more Google mesh things to like get everybody <laughs> enough, you know, in the house? Cause it was, it was a lot. It was, it was definitely, a, a lot and it was hard to balance that time I know that for me I felt like um as a mom when they go to school I, I don't mind the work of like the mornings and making lunches and breakfast and then the pickup because it's like you have that solid time to yourself to be working but what was hard during the pandemic was like lunch and snacks like in the middle of the day I was like wait a minute I was like okay okay so I started to make lunch in the morning like I normally would even though they didn't go anywhere and my little one was not happy about that she was like well but you're here and you know I don't really just want this sort of cold sandwich like there can be you know there's a microwave It'd like hot lunch. <laughs> right it's like there's hot lunch like at school you know it's like at school she doesn't complain because you know, I wasn't there and there weren't other options, but mm -hmm. at home, and then we were like, we, America. this could be all day long. Cause if you have this break here and then this one has this break, no one had the same schedule. So like someone was in the kitchen, like all day long and all that pandemic snacking, yeah. it was always a challenge for yeah. me. So it's like, oh my goodness, you know, it was, <laughs> it, <laughs> it wasn't easy, but. Oh my goodness. It's so too, you know, my kids at the time were, 12 and 18 and Toshi was, you know, she was in her first year of college, but that was a bus. So she was back home and, and then we, everybody was, it was a nightmare. And I was like, why is there, why are there so many snacks necessary? And then Jackson, you know, it was just crazy. But I, I finally was like, everybody in this house needs to learn to cook <laughs> because I'm done. So, totally. I was just like, I'm willing to burn spoons and things just to like everybody can at least get to the point of like, you know, some mac and cheese and yeah, I don't know, like stuff that, you know, again, idealistically, when you're a parent, you're starting out thinking, I'm gonna be, you know, making organic meats and making salads, every, yeah. you know, and then it's just like, okay, there's some ramen noodles. Here's how you make it. I'm like <laughs> teaching my 11 year old, like when I was in college, it's like, okay, boil the water. Yeah, pack it. Only use you know? half the packet because it has high sodium. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, dilute it, you know, with more. I mean, you know, we all did the best we could, you know, and that's what it's like in general. I think being an artist too and a parent, like, you've got to try to find that balance because you don't want to be resentful. And I feel like that's part of what Juliet's battle was too, as you come in to see in the book, like she had a, had an amazing uh, career starting as a pianist and she was really wanted to be, um, you know, on tour and wanted to be out. Mm -hmm. And she also fell in love with this baby and wanted to, to take care of him. And it was like very hard for her to figure out that balance and the, and to juggle that. Um, and so you're right, I'm, I'm definitely talking about those themes as well, which I think are, are very present in my own life as a parent, the constant, you know, the balance, trying to find that. Um, and also the difference, you know, between being a, a woman and being a man, because she's like talking about her dad and, and, you know, and he raised her, her mother died when she was young uh, and he raised his two kids, but, you know, he, he had a lot of support you know he had a tenure job and he had you know he could hire babysitters and stuff and she was like a struggling artist when her yeah. kids you know when, when jenry was young and 
it's just a different world and different expectations too about being a mother versus being a father. Um, so I like, I, I wanted to sort of talk about that too. Um, I love that you do. I love that you, I think that that's something missing, too often missing in literature is the choices that mothers have to make around their careers and that longing and that loss and, um, um, and that invisibility. You know, especially for mothers who are artists. I mean, we, we, I think of us in terms of our writing and having to leave home to go on book tour or to teach and, and come and, and, you know, the house being held down and you come back and your kids are older. Like it, it is really a lot of choices that get made that I think a lot of mothers, whether they have to leave home, whether they're artists or not, end up having to make on the daily, um, which is another reason why I think this book speaks to so many of us. Um, so Patricia Crow Davis, hey Patricia, she says your characters, or they say your characters are so well developed. Do you make an outline for each character before you put them on the paper? Do your does your character do your characters talk to you? They definitely talk to me, definitely, definitely in this book for sure. And I do do, I do do outlining. Um, I would say with. I think of it as an outline and I know and my students know that's too. It's like one of the lectures that I give um, it's falling about outlining in terms of writing the novel and thinking about the narrative. And then in terms of the character development, I think of it as more, um, it's just to try to, I, I always have these sheet, these like character cheat sheets that I start and, and I, every time I know something about them, I write it down. So it could be physical description things, it could be like, you know, all these different, like what they like to eat, you know, what they, if, you know, if they had a favorite book, what would it be? You know, how do they dress? What's their body like? Like all these different things like that I want to know about them. Um, and I don't sit down and, and like fill it in before I write, but I, I, when it comes out in a scene, I, I write it down too, because I want to know sort of who does what. And what do I know about them? And, and just make sure that they feel full. Um, and I think part of what I also do in terms of plucking from the truths of my life and then fictionalizing, I like to take elements from different people and then put them into one character over here that I've created. So I'm always just sort of scanning people and experiences for those elements. And it's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna put that little quirk in this one, I'm gonna put this, you know, longing in this one. I mean, there's basic things that I need to know about each of them. I definitely always wanna know um, those sort of like inner drive, like secrets, demons for all my characters, you know, like obviously this book is set up around secrets um, in terms of the plot, but even in, in everything I've written, there's always something where I'm like, what is this character holding from at least one person in their life? You know, what are they, what are they lying to themselves about? Um, you know, like what is their greatest, you know, dream or ambition? Like what are they longing for? You know, that like yearning of the characters that, that I think we all relate to. Um, and what do they say on the surface versus like what's going on underneath? Um, and I also like with family members too, I, I like dialogue a lot and I like to think about how people like within a family, children often speak similarly, but then I also want them to have a different voice, you know? So, so I'm always playing with stuff like that for authenticity. Um, so like with Jasper and Juliet, when you're with them later, you know, I, I, they have a certain banter. Um, and, and I find that the sibling bond is very interesting. And I know that with my brothers growing up, you know, we thought when we were together all the time, we, we notice our differences and then we'll go apart and we have families and we grow up and we get back together. I would just notice how similar we were. I'm like, oh my God, like this brother, he would like stack up all his books right at his bedside, just like I do. And my other brother, like he's doing dishes and he, he finishes the kitchen every night and does the same thing I do. And like, we're not seeing each other. It's like, wow, it's like wow. wild to me, the ways in which, and the things we say that sound similar um, when we've been apart. And so I like to look for things like that and like slip those in to, to make wow. it feel to me recognizable and more, more realistic. Wow, that's so intense and true. 
Um, Sam Zaxby is asking, any songs, tunes that you pair with the other mother? What's your playlist? Do you have one? Can we find oh it on gosh. Spotify? And then we're leaving. I, I actually do. And in fact, that's so funny because I don't think I even have any followers on Spotify. But now that I think about it, I'm like, did I make it private? Like in case, because when I was working, I do in terms of the jazz um, and some of the classical music that's in the, the book, both so like Jenry's doing a lot of classical um, and then Juliet's period when she was going deep into jazz, I listened repeatedly to several songs um, and I do have a little playlist. I have a, a playlist called Juliet's Practice Set. <laughs> and I was like thinking about what she would have grown up listening to. And of course I'm pulling a lot out of the jazz that I grew up listening to because of my father's and his obsession with jazz and John Coltrane and um, McCoy Tyner and of course Miles Davis. And so, you know, I've got the sort of classics and then I'm also thinking about the time in which she was playing in, in the nineties um, and some of the younger people, you know, the Joshua Redman and people coming up um, then. And so I do have that and I don't feel like I can, other than those people, but you can find me later. Um, you can either ask, that would be a great question if you want to follow up on my website or on social media, um, Sam, if you want me to actually give you those specifics, I'm happy to share, but I don't have, um, there was one song that was very moving to me um, that I don't, I just have it hearted and I played it over and over again. Um, that had to do with the loss of Jasper for Juliet. Um, and I had lost one of my own brothers, um, uh, you know, young and uh, younger and unexpectedly. And it was very emotional for me to write some of those sequences and deal with um, her loss and my own. And so this song kind of got me through that period as well. Um, but yeah, find me sometime if you, if you want to know that, because I would, I would waste too much time of this to try to find it. Um, are you, so you're on social media, Instagram and Twitter? Yes, I am. Um, you know, I'm not great I, on any of them. Obviously, I feel like I've been so deep in the writing and then the, you know, the editing process of this book that I try not to have much of a presence when I'm deep in work. Um, but I've come out of that this winter and I'm trying um, and Instagram, um, you know, I think it's it's fun because as a writer, when you're doing so much writing, it's fun to not have to say a lot, you know, yeah. to just like, I like the images and the stories and, you know, so I'm trying to be better about that. And that's right, that's Harps and Cali. Um, and then Facebook, I'm also on mostly, I, I think Twitter, you know, I feel a little bit too constrained. I, I'm, I'm, I'm there rarely, um, but I do try, I try to just like repost and, and um, have a little a little bit more political I feel like over there um, you know which it's funny how you have like different you know I'm trying to learn the different spaces for different agendas or different things that you can do um, but you know I've got I've got young people in the house so I'm definitely trying to get a little bit more savvy let them do it of, you know, exactly I really, I was, I was, I was having to ask my daughter. I was like, okay, wait, what the story thing, and then the reposting, and then this like paper airplane, and what's happening here? I definitely had to get a little oh, bit tutorial. I was like, before the book tour, help, help, help your me. mama. <laughs> so, so it's eight fifty-five, but I really want to take these last two questions from Mary Edwards and Lyle Hibbler. Um, and I know Powell's is going to come back on, so. Um, so Lyle's question is, how much does anti-CRT frothing impact teaching writing or writing itself impact what either of you do? Is there hope that you have this, is there hope that this will pass and people can write to authentic experiences without fear of anti-diversity reaction? I'm actually not sure I understand that question. So I'm gonna let Rachel answer it. Yeah, um, I, from what I think I understand, um in terms of thinking about anti-diversity, I have been very fortunate, you know, the programs that I've taught within um, have really encouraged diversity in terms of like, uh, you know, the literature that we read, 
and our own, you know, our own work um, and our students' work, you know, and diversity in many different ways in terms of not just, you know, race, but sexual orientation and ability and, you know, neurodiversity and everything. I mean, we all know it comes in many packages. Um, so I feel very fortunate about that uh, because I think it would be very hard. Um, and I, I don't know that I could do it in, a, in an environment um, where my stories and my students' stories in so many different ways weren't being, um, you know, respected and held up. So I feel, I, I feel grateful that the places that I've taught uh, do support us. Cool. I, I feel the same way. And censorship sells books. So, you know, keep fighting it. Keep um, fighting against it by buying our books at independent bookstores, and we will be all right. <laughs> And the final question is from Mary Edwards. If when there is a cinema, cinematic adaptation, who would you like to see cast in the film role? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, yes, I think those of us who are interested in adaptation and which I certainly am and just, I love, um, you know, things that we can all watch now, which feel sort of novelistic, some of the, the stories being told. Um, I would say right now that the only person that's really clear to me is Winston. Um, I, I love Lawrence Fishburne and he's a little young, but I've seen, I feel like he could still play um, older than he is. And I've seen him at times with a, like a goatee and the glasses and he could look very professorial. Um, but when I was writing at the beginning, you know, and I was thinking my father that I had this idea of James Earl Jones um, because he always reminded all of us of my dad because of his size and his intensity. Um, but he's too old, uh, but, but Fishburne, I would love. And I'm still, I'm taking ideas, Mary, if you have them, um, because, <laughs> You know, we're all sort of playing around with it and thinking about who would be good for who now. And I'm definitely, um, I'm open to thinking about that. I love, I, I often picture, I try not to just picture one person, but sometimes in the writing process, you do end up kind of like falling for a certain image, but I'm open. Well, and it's so cinematic. I mean, I can't imagine it not being made into something that we can actually yeah, I hope so. I think I think it could be great. I think it, you know, it's another way to get, you know, um, more people involved in stories too. Cause I find like when there's adaptations, a lot of times people end up go, you know, wanting to go back to the book as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just like another iteration. It doesn't end that. So I, I'm definitely down for, for that opportunity if it comes along. Well, thanks Rachel. This has been fun. I miss you. I miss you too. And thank you so much. I, I really, when I was when I was writing this book, and then we were, they were talking about who I would love to talk with, I was definitely like, I really think that Jackie would vibe with this story. So I'm so glad it. that it worked out. I'm so glad Powell's could host us. So I appreciate you being here, and all of you guys. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm sure I'll, I'll get to look at the chat later, but I, I'm so grateful that we all were able to be here together. Yay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both so much for uh, joining us tonight. Thanks for the great conversation and great, uh, all that great talk and all that. Yep. Go get, go get the other mother, please, here. So that's the one. Check it out. Um, put a, a link in there. Check out pals.com. Um, yeah, and while you're there, check out future, uh, our future lineup of events. We've got lots of great stuff out there. But yeah, um, once again, uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you both so much again. Thank you, Nick. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you everyone. Yay. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.